Farm System preview for the San Diego Padres, where that top four might be as good as any other top four in all of baseball. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked on MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, award-winning baseball writer and podcaster. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. We're proudly part of the Locked on Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. And today's episode is made possible by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So as we've been doing these farm previews, the, the usual pattern that we follow is top prospects in the system, players you might see in 24 at the major league level, and then lower level prospects to watch. And there's a lot of overlap, I feel like, in some of those categories in the Padres system. But the big thing that I took away from all of the prep I did for this is just how good the top three, top four players in this system really are. So your top prospects, catcher Ethan Salas, Shortstop Jackson Merrill, left-hand pitcher Robbie Snelling, all three of those guys were in our show where we talked about best catching prospects in baseball, best shortstop prospects in baseball, best left-handed pitching prospects in baseball. All three of those guys made that made those lists. Those five, six, seven guys we talked about, Padres prospects were in all three of those. And then right-hand pitcher Dylan Lesko only reason he probably didn't make it was because having Tommy John surgery and being slow to get back and having a limited sample size of production after surgery. Talking about these guys real quick, we've done a lot of stuff recently on Ethan Salas. Not necessarily going to go in super into depth on Ethan Salas. There's plenty of stuff on in this podcast feed on this YouTube channel talking about Ethan Salas. We are going to point out there were people that had questions about Ethan Salas getting pushed all the way to double A in his age 16 to 17 season. He turned 17 on June 1st, technically age 17 season. And I there's I understand both sides of this, right? I understand the argument of this is not only incredibly aggressive for a general manager in AJ Preller, who is an incredibly aggressive general manager. This may be one of the most aggressive prospect moves he's ever made. At the same time, the explanation of they wanted to keep him in that same group of guys as some of those prospects moving up so that he could work with those pitchers, he could learn from those play. Like I understand that side of the argument. And he had a knee sprain, he only got 9 games in A San Antonio before his season ended. He'll be healthy and ready by spring training. It's going to be very interesting to see what Ethan Salas does in 2024. One of the biggest storylines, I think, in minor league baseball. And depending on how many guys ahead of him get promoted to the majors, which we expect a lot of them to get promoted early next year, or Jackson Holiday, or Jackson Churio, things like that. Ethan Salas could be the number one prospect in all of baseball by mid-season next year. Right behind him is shortstop Jackson Merrill. And very talented player. 2021 first rounder out of high school. And I feel like a lot of the value for Jackson Merrill... Or I guess a lot of the ceiling for Jackson Merrill depends on defensively where is he going to end up playing. Does he stay at shortstop or does he have to move to a different position? And let's clarify, it's if Jackson Merrill moves off a shortstop, it's not because of his skill as a shortstop. He is a talented defensive player. He has good arm strength, good agility, good range, and it feels as you watched him last year, one, he started off slow in high A Fort Wayne. He had some some medical issues, nothing mechanical or structural. It was like a, the flu or something like that. Uh, and then he had a hamstring strain in double A. But around some of that stuff, you could see that he was getting better defensively. He was acclimating the internal clock to the timing of professional baseball 
and, and how that works. The arm strength, he was dialing in the arm strength and the accuracy, getting better with the range. And I think ultimately he would be an average to above average defender at shortstop if you leave him there. But obviously in San Diego, there's a lot of options to play shortstop uh, as far as Sandra Bogarts, as long Kim, different guys like that. And so he may have to play somewhere else. And apparently they looked at bringing him up the end of the year last year and they left him in double A San Antonio along with the rest of these guys. Slash line, 114 games between high A Fort Wayne and double A San Antonio. 277, 326, 444 for Jackson Merrill. 15 home runs, 44 extra base hits, 35 walks to 62 strikeouts, and 15 of 19 on stolen bases. We said that he was good enough to stick at shortstop. He did start moving around later in the year to to get ready in case they needed him in the majors. He played left field five times. He played first. He played second. He DH'd a little bit. I think the arm is good enough where he could play third if you needed them to. So uh, you could move him around quite a bit. Uh, From an offensive standpoint, it's been really impressive to watch Jackson Merrill improve at the plate and adjust his approach as he moves up the ladder and not suffer a lot of the ill effects from it. So 2022... He has a, an overall contact rate of 85%, zone contact rate of 90. He moves up to obviously high A and then double A in 2023. Contact rate, 83%. So it's within 2% of what it was the year before. Zone contact, 88%. It's within 2% of what it was the year before. He chased more in 23. It went from like 26.5% to 30%. But his strikeout rate didn't go up. And I'm just really impressed with the contact ability of Jackson Merrill. And he's a guy who's seen as, he's 6'3", 200. He added a bunch of weight right for the draft, but good weight. He's got good exit velocities, both average, 90th percentile, things like that. That he's he has promising power. And then obviously, the contact ability is really good. I do think, and you saw him improve this a little bit last year. I do think he still hits a little bit too much as far as ground balls. He was closer to 60%. He brought it down to about 40%. Still feels like it's a little bit high. I think that if everything clicks for Jackson Merrill, your 90th percentile outcome, right? It's a guy that could bat 300 with 25 homers, probably 10 stolen bases, not a huge part of his game but really high on the ceiling of Jackson Merrill. And I feel like he showed us the floor is also a lot higher than we thought it would be. So big fan of Jackson Merrill. Robbie Snellen and Dylan Lesko, go back and watch the uh, top left-handed pitching prospects to hear more in depth about Robbie Snelling. But just know the first rounder in 2022, one of the best pitchers in all of the minors last year. 22 starts between single A, high A, and double A. Again, that whole group of guys went together. 11-3 11-3 and three with a 182 ERA and 103 and two-thirds innings. 118 strikeouts for Robbie Snelling. 10.2 per nine to 34 walks. Three per nine and only four home runs allowed. Literally 0.3 home runs per nine innings. So did all of this in his age 19 season. It is, the combination is fastball curve change and it feels like they're better collectively than individually. The fastball sits 93 to 94, so he can run it up to 96. Does really well up in the zone. Uh, Curveballs in the lower 80s. It's not always consistent. Sometimes I feel like it looks more like a slider than a curveball, but sits in the lower 80s. That two-plane break to it, uh, he'll throw it to both lefties and righties. Uh, He'll throw it in the zone for a swing and miss, out of the zone for chase. Uh, also has a changeup, needs some more work to do. Not quite there yet. Not surprised. Again, he's a 19-year-old. That's to be expected. A lot of prep pitchers don't have great changeups. But either way, just think he's absolutely fantastic. If that changeup ends up coming to an average to above average third pitch and the fastball is consistently 95-96, you're looking at a number two pitcher in MLB. This ceiling's the limit for, uh, for Robbie Snelling. And then Dylan Lesko had Tommy John his senior season of high school. They still took him at 15 overall in 2022. He got in 12 games last year, rookie ball, single A, and high A. The stats weren't great. One and five with a 5-4-5 ERA for Dylan Lesko. 33 innings, 52 strikeouts, 14.2 per nine, to 22 walks, six walks per nine, 
Only three home runs allowed, so 0.8 per nine innings. The stuff looked good, but the strikes, the strike throwing was not necessarily there. He was under 60% strikes. As we know, control is usually one of the last things to come back after Tommy John, so it makes sense. But in the meantime, fastball, changeup, curveball, he was the rare prepser that had a good changeup. Fastball, uh, 95 or so, 20 inches of induced vertical break. Just f- phenomenal numbers. Very good fastball. Changeup. Arm speed matches exactly, but a lot of late movement to it. More than 10 mile an hour velocity difference. Impressive changeup. Curveball, mid to upper 70s. It's a vertical breaker. He's not always consistent with landing it for a strike, so something he has to work on. But the potential is there, and the one-two punch of those first two are amazing. 2024 is probably the year that Dylan Lesko shoots up into into probably the top five right-hand pitching prospects in all of baseball conversation, assuming that he's healthy and he performs. In just a minute, let's talk about some of the guys you might see in 2024. I've got two hitters and two pitchers. We'll talk about them next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. The NFL season, the regular season is just about over, but you've still got time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets uh, guaranteed when you place any $5 bet. Like, win or lose, you place a $5 bet, you get $150 in bonus bets Win or lose, go pick a random NFL game that's coming up to end the regular season. Bet on that game, and you get $150 to go out and play with all of the MLB futures that are out there. National League West, the Padres, as of time of recording, are the number three odds to win the West, plus $900 for the Padres, plus $750 for the Diamondbacks, minus $350 for the Dodgers. Looking at the World Series odds, you do have... Padres at plus 3,800 if you want to go out and get that value play, if you believe in them there. And then player awards, you do have some interesting options out there for player awards if you want to go maybe think, oh, do we have a guy who could win MVP? Do we have a guy who could win Cy Young? Things like that. So go to FanDuel.com slash Locked On. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. Okay, so I've got two position players that I think you'll see in 2024. It feels like it's probably a second half of the season thing, but we're going to talk about them anyway. And it's utility guy Graham Pauly and outfielder Jacob Marcy. Pauly, 2022 13th rounder out of Duke, had a fantastic debut last year in professional baseball. 127 games, single A, high A, and double A. So he went three levels again. Following that same group with Jackson Merrill, with Robbie Snelling, Ethan Salas, they all went together. 308, 393, 539 slash line for Graham Pauly. 23 home runs, 60 extra base hits, 60 walks to 93 strikeouts, 22 at 27 on stolen bases. What you need to know here, offensively, he's a left-handed hitter with good strike zone discipline And I feel like a lot of people were surprised by the amount of power that Graham Polly was able to generate. I don't necessarily know. I think if a lot of MLB teams had known that his power potential was putting up a 540 slugging percentage, you probably see him earlier than the 13th round. Good strikes on discipline, surprising amount of power, should be able to run high batting averages, and good speed. I say good speed. I, I feel like it's it's more so average to slightly above average, and he's so good at stealing bases because he's ve- at a very technically sound and instinctual base runner, more so than just getting by on pure speed. And Jacob Marcy is actually in a similar boat. We'll get to him in a second. Defensively for Pauly, he played most often at third base, at 85 games at third base, but he played some second. He played some left field as well, and I think... He's probably one of your go-tos, him or Eggy Rosario, uh, go-tos if you have somebody who's injured at the major league level and you need to have somebody fill in. Graham Pauly is an option to come up and fill one of those spots. It feels, again, third base, second base, left field. He DH'd a little bit. You don't use him as a DH. You'd use somebody else as a DH and let him play defensively. But feels like that's his fit on the roster, probably second half of 24. 
Jacob Marcy, another guy I think you're going to see in the second half. 2022 sixth rounder out of Central Michigan. And everybody knows him now because of what he did in the Arizona Fall League. Last year, 129 games between high A and double A, staying with that same group that moved up. 274, 413, 428 for Jacob Marcy. 16 home runs, 35 extra base hits, 98 walks to 97 strikeouts, and 46 of 55 on stolen bases. Really good contact, really good pitch recognition, wasn't hitting for a lot of power. They asked him to just try to hit for some more power. He goes to the Arizona Fall League, 24 games, 391, 509, 707 slugging percentage, five home runs in 24 games in Arizona, 18 extra base hits, 21 walks to 25 strikeouts, 16 and 19 on stolen bases. Uh, Another guy where base stealing wise, it feels like it's more skill than pure speed, although I do feel like he has more pure speed than Graham Pauly does. In minors last year, he only played center and left. He played a little bit of right field in Arizona. A lot of guys play a lot of different positions in Arizona. I still feel like he's more of a center field to left field option. But with Trent Grisham getting traded and leaving in the Juan Soto deal, it's entirely possible he get Jacob Marcy gets a look in center field because, again, the, the contact is good. The pitch recognition is good. You want to see if that pa- extra power production you saw at the very end of the regular season and in Arizona was good or not, like, is going to stick or not, right? But... Either way, can play all three outfield positions, would profile best in center or left. And a lot of people are high on Jacob Marcy. In fantasy, he's probably a little bit overvalued based on what happened in Arizona. But outside of that, I am excited about watching what he does. I would assume he'll open in AAA El Paso with the Chihuahuas. Two pitchers I think you're going to see. Both of them finish the year at AA. Right-hand pitcher Adam Mazur. And then Jairo Iriarte, and I'm probably saying that wrong, and I apologize if I am. So for Mazur, 2022 second rounder out of Iowa, got in 24 games, but 18 starts between high A and double A. A a lot of guys got some workload relief with some bullpen appearances or coming in right after a a major leaguer who was rehabbing. And so a lot of these numbers, they didn't start every single game because they may have been the second pitcher in and they came in the second inning or so. But... Uh, 24 appearances, 6-4 and four, with a 2-8-1 ERA for Adam Mazur. 96 innings, 90 strikeouts, 8.4 per 9, 217 walks, 1.6 per 9, 5 home runs allowed. Not as eye-poppingly amazing strikeout numbers as you would expect from a prospect who would get into a 30-minute prospect preview, but the control is absolutely fantastic. I feel like there's a little bit more velocity you can get out of there. Fastball sits 93 to 95 or so, but he's got a power slider in the upper 80s. He's got a mid-80s changeup and a vertical breaking curveball. So if you think about the directions of everything, the fastball up, slider one way, change up the other curveball down. He's covering all your directions from a velocity band standpoint, fastball mid 90s, slider upper 80s, change up mid 80s, curveball is usually upper 70s to low 80s. So he's four different velocity bands, four different directions. Y'all know I'm a everydayers know I'm a big fan of the guys who can do all those different kind of things because it gives you more options. And when you pair that with what I feel is really good control, again, 17 walks, 1.6 walks per nine innings, you have a guy that could help at the major league level uh, probably sooner rather than later. You did just get a bunch of pitchers via trade, and I don't know how soon you'll need him, but I feel like he can help. Jairo Iarte, the other guy, 2018 IFA, signed for only $75,000, but 27 games, again, high A to double A, 21 of those were starts. Three and four with a 3-4-9 ERA in 90 and a third innings. 128 strikeouts, so 12.8 per nine, 245 walks, 4.5 per nine, and four home runs allowed, 0.4 per nine innings. The stuff is really good for Iarte. The fastball sits in the upper 90s. He can touch 100 with it. He's got a two-plane breaking slider in the mid-80s. He's got a changeup that is a faster changeup. It doesn't have necessarily the same 10-mile-an-hour separation, but it's a really good tunnel with the fastball, and it's a vertical breaking changeup. Instead of having all of that run, it drops instead. So 
you're not covering every single direction. You've got fastball changeup slider on a two plane, but the velocities are really good, especially on that fastball. And so another guy that they're high on, there's I feel like there's a little bit of reliever risk there. They're not 100% sure if he's going to be a starter or not. I think he can be. Very excited to see what comes out of Hiroyarte, if I'm saying that right. In just a minute, let's talk about some of the prospects that are still in the lower minors or just barely made it to double A that have some more work to do. We'll do that next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. Final segment of Locked on MLB Prospects here doing our Padres 2024 farm system preview. And a couple of guys I want to talk about. Uh, the first one is Nathan Marcharella. I have him listed as an outfielder and a first baseman because I'm not 100% sure where he's going to end up playing. 2022 fifth rounder. Had really high expectations for him entering last year. And he was fine. You know, coming out of Cal Berkeley. Did fine, but not necessarily anything special like we thought he would break out. Uh, 135 games between high A and double A. 255. 361, 437, 19 home runs, 50 extra base hits, 82 walks to 101 strikeouts, 5 for 8 on stolen bases. Things to know here, power is really good, okay? 90th percentile exit velocity of 106, plus power right there. He made good contact, not great, but good contact, about 77%, and he did not chase a ton, about it was below 20%, he walked, had good walk rates and all of that. The issue here is he was a really passive hitter. He swung, I think, just under 40% of the time. And you see those guys who are incredibly passive. You often see some of those guys struggle when they initially move up and they face better pitchers who can more often and more consistently hit the edge of the zone, hit the black, strike them out looking and things like that. So I feel the batting average seems a little bit low, it probably would be a little bit better if he wasn't so passive. He, d- he does also hit the ball on the ground a lot. Uh, that's not the super easiest thing to fix, obviously. But he's going to be a guy who could hit 20 home runs. He's going to run high on base percentages because he does have a good batter's eye. Question's going to be, defensively, does he play first base or outfield? And uh, how long does it take him to adjust? So watch Nathan Marcharella this year. Another guy I was a fan of, right-hand pitcher Victor Lizaraga. And it's his stat lines are incredibly fascinating. So 2021 IFA got a million dollars and made 21 starts in high A, so in Fort Wayne, after making uh, 19 starts and 20 total appearances in single A Lake Elsinore. So four and seven record, 409 ERA for Victor Lizaraga, 94 and two thirds innings, 78 strikeouts, 7.4 per nine, to 34 walks, 3.2 per nine, and five home runs allowed, 0.5 per nine innings. Last year, okay, 3.43 ERA in 94 and a third innings. So he pitches one third of an inning more this year. He has 95 strikeouts, so 9.1 per nine. That was better. He has exactly 34 walks allowed last year as well and exactly five home runs allowed last year as well. And some of the difference in ERA comes down to unearned runs, right? He allows 48 runs in 2022, but only 36 of those are earned. Defense is worse, lower in the minors. In 2023, Victor Lizarraga allows 46 runs, and 43 of those are earned. That's why it ticks a little bit higher on the ERA. It goes up just over half a run. The whip actually came down a little bit. Those stat lines are remarkably similar. And when you look at him and what he does, I feel like another guy, there's still some more growth that you can get here. He's listed at 6'3", 180. And when he gets just turned 20 years old, the end of November, when he gets a little bit more of what some baseball coaches call that man strength as he gets a little bit older, you're going to see the fastball tick up a bit. Right now it sits 92 to 93. He's got a vertical breaking curveball in the high 70s, is his most preferred secondary, also has a slider and a change. All of the tools are there to cover four directions, to cover four velocity bands, just needs to get more consistent with those back two pitches, and then needs to have more velocity. So I like 
I'm really curious to see what he might do this year. A couple other guys to watch for that are really interesting. Also arms. I really think there's a good depth of arms in this system. It's just who can get developed. And then the joke is who doesn't get traded by AJ Preller. So left-hand pitcher Jagger Haynes returned from Tommy John last year. Mid-90s fastball, slider and a change. I like his stuff. I think he could be somebody when he gets a little farther away from Tommy John and gets that health, uh, gets that control back that you see after Tommy John. Right-hand pitcher Cannon Kemp. Uh, both of those are with Ks. Cannon with a K, Kemp with a K. Uh, eighth rounder out of high school in 2023. 6'6", And I think there's a lot of potential here out of that class last year. Throws a mid-90s fastball. At times, it looked like maybe he was throwing two different fastballs. It would cut sometimes. It would run sometimes. I don't know if he was trying to throw a cutter and a two-seamer or if it's just inconsistencies for him. I like the combination. I like the pairing. I thought it worked pretty decently. He also has a low 80s slider and a mid 80s change. If he ends up going with two different fastballs, I think it gives him some really interesting looks for uh, for opposing hitters. Want to see that be a little more consistent, but another guy that I'm watching for this year. And then like we do in every one of these farm previews, we've got our two dart throws, right? These are our guys that have some promise, have some things to work on, but if you see some tweaks, these guys could take off next year. Sometimes they're on prospect lists, sometimes they're not, no promises there. But the first one, and the one that I like the most of these, outfielder Homer Bush Jr., 2023 fourth rounder out of Grand Canyon, and 44 games between rookie ball, A ball, and double A. 325, 422, 440. Three home runs, 12 extra base hits in 44 games for Homer Bush. 20 walks to 24 strikeouts. And 22 of 24 on stolen bases. He averaged a stolen base every other game in his Major League debut last year. He's 6'3", 200. And I think the question you have here... The big overarching question for Homer Bush is the power, right? He was entering the draft. He was seen as a guy who was severely lacking in raw power. And obviously a 440 slug is not terrible. It's three home runs in 44 games isn't also that great. So where does that power ceiling end up? But outside of that, he's got good speed. He's got good contact ability. He's a pretty good defensive outfielder who can run the bases really well. And even if he's not necessarily an everyday regular, he's the kind of guy that there's always a role for defensively sound, speedy outfielders that can make good contact, can reliably make contact. There's always a role for those guys on major league rosters. He played 16 games in center and 20 games in left. So you're worried about his arm being a little bit limited, but He's a guy, if you get some power development, and I don't know how likely that is after three years of college, but if you can see some power development in 2024, he could hit the prospect rankings and move up simply because he offers so many other aspects of his game, right? The other guy, infielder Marcos Castanon, I believe that is right. There's a tilde in that name, so I'm doing the best I can here, but 2021 12th rounder out of UC Santa Barbara and 131 games last year. Again, high A to double A. That was, they they wanted to get these guys into San Antonio. 284, 345, 468, 17 home runs, 57 extra base hits for Casanon in 131 games, 47 walks to 119 strikeouts, one for one on stolen bases. Infield option, right, played third base, played second base, hasn't played shortstop in a while, so he's listed some places as a shortstop. The Padres have never played him at shortstop. The last time he played shortstop was in college. They've played him at first, they've played him at second, they've played him at third, but last year it's been mostly second and third. Really good hit cool. Contact rates over 75%. Exit velocities are good but very aggressive approach. He swung over half of the time, and so I think that there's probably a little bit better power potential out there if the swing decisions 
it's one of, it's a fine line to walk, right? You don't want to be too passive, but I think in this case, you absolutely can dial it back a little bit and not settle for suboptimal contact and you'll probably have better outcomes. So I think his is maybe a little more fixable than Homer Bush because his is more of a swing decision correction than it is a physical power, adding power thing to do in the offseason. But Marcos Casanon can be an infield option. Again, second base, third base, probably some first base. He's only six foot tall, but that's good enough for first base if he can just work on the swing decisions a little bit. Fantastic week this week where we have two more of these to go, Diamondbacks and Dodgers on Friday and Saturday. We are still doing Monday Mailbag. So if you have a question for the show, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Show's on Twitter at Locked On Farm. Every other way to reach us, it's in the episode description. It's in the show notes. Until tomorrow's show, remember, it's always a great time to pay a minor leaguer. 